I brought too. Thanks. <clears throat> it's good to be with you this morning. It's been a while since I've been up here. Um, I am so thankful to be back, being able to bring God's word to you this morning. Thank you so much, Haas. Um, just a little bit of an introduction on me. My name is Brad Alvin. Um, I've been married to my beautiful bride, Natalie, for 15 years. Um, we celebrated our anniversary last month. We have a little girl, Harper, who is 11, going to be in sixth grade next year. And Matthew, who is six, going to be in first grade next year. If you want to know more about my story, you want to hear from my wife and I, please come back at, at 1.30 and you can hear my testimony and how God called me into ministry. So this morning, however, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, turn there. We're going to be kind of all over in the Bible this morning, but we're going to be camped out Hebrews 12. and We're going to look at the first two verses. But before we continue, let me pray for our time. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. God, thank you for your word. God, I pray that you would calm our hearts down, God, so that we could hear your voice. God, we, we need your wisdom to understand what the text says. And God, not only, not only understand it, God, but to apply it to our lives. God, help us see who Jesus Christ is. And God, that, that he is good and great all the time. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. I want to start this morning with a question. As you get to know me, you'll, you'll learn that I love questions because they engage our minds. And this question might seem kind of simple uh, at the onset, but I can tell you this. It actually has very good, good meaning when we start to think about what it means to our lives. And here's the question for this morning to start us off. It's this. Where does our joy come from? Where does your joy come from? come from? To answer that question, I think you need to first define what joy is, and here's a definition of joy. It's a delight or satisfaction in life that runs deeper than pain or pleasure. Let me say that again. It's a delight or satisfaction in life that runs deeper than pain or pleasure, meaning this, that its, its roots go down so far and so deep that no matter what happens in life, the good times and the bad that there is always going to be joy. And so as we examine our lives and we say, okay, where does the joy in my life, where does it truly come from? And we go down different levels, eventually you're going to come to a place called the foundation, the bottom. There's no place further to go. And let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Let's pretend hypothetically that, that one morning I walk into church and I see Caleb Sherman. Caleb's right over here. He's going to go to the U of A, right? And Caleb has this big grin on his face. He's just smiling. I said, Caleb, what, what are you so happy about? And he says, oh, I got an A in a test. I would say, well, that's great, but a lot of people get a lot of A's on a lot of tests. What makes this one so special? He goes, well, this one gets me into the U of A. And I said, well, that's wonderful news, but why do you want to go to, go to the U of A? Well, I, I want to go through their history program. They have a great history program there, and I want to learn about American history and world history. And I would say, that's wonderful. Why do you like it? Well, I like the stories. And I could keep saying why and why and why, and, and he kept giving answers and answers and answers, but eventually, we're going to have to stop. There's going to be no more questions I can ask, no more, no more answers he can give. That is what I mean by foundation. And when we look at our own lives and we again examine it, what gives me joy? We're going to come to the bottom of where our joy truly comes from, the foundation. Now, please make no mistake, I don't mean happiness. Happiness is a wonderful thing. Happiness is a good thing. But happiness is an emotion and it ebbs and it flows. If you've been married for more than five minutes, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I love my wife dearly. I'm committed to her. She is a great wife and a great mom. But sometimes we don't see eye to eye. And that happiness begins to fade a little bit. It'll come back up, but it begins to fade. Same thing with children, right? Those of you who have children, oh, they can be so wonderful. But sometimes they know how to push the wrong button. And that smile on your face quickly <laughs> turns. Like the gray hair on my head is not just from age. It's from stress of a six-year-old little boy who I love dearly, but again, the happiness kind of flows and comes and it goes. Now, hopefully, you are happier than not with your wife and your children, but our joy, what sustains it? 
In other words, the fountain that never runs dry. What is yours? I want us to see this this morning, friends, and this is point number one of, of one. I'm going to say this over and over again, so if you get anything out of this morning, please hear this. There's only one place, or more specifically, one person that can be the sustainer of our joy. There's only one place, one person that is strong enough that no matter what life throws at us, that person will never crack. That foundation will never crumble. The source and sustainer of our joy should only be Jesus Christ because he is able to be it. Let's read about this in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It states this. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Um, you can probably tell by, just by looking at me, but I'm a bigger guy. I'm not one for exercising a lot. It's not on my mind when I wake up in the morning, okay? I don't get up and think, oh, man, I cannot wait to go for a run. First thing, coffee. Second thing, what am I eating for breakfast? Always in that order. I'm not a big runner. In fact, I, I brought my running shoes with me this morning to show you how little I run in my life. And these are, these are pretty new-ish looking shoes, and they got good soles on them. Um, this is how much I run. These are five and a half years old. They see more closet time than they see street time, and that is for sure. And I think this, this comes from this, this, this inhibition of, of running comes from, a, from a, a situation I had when I was younger. It was seventh or eighth grade. I don't remember exactly which one. It was PE class. And there was this standard that you had to meet to get a good grade in PE class. You had to be able to run a mile in 10 minutes or under. And back then, I was a big guy again, but I was way shorter, so I had these little stubby legs, and I'm like, this is going to be really hard. But the day comes, and I'm thinking, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get this A because I'm not going to get an A, any, any, an a in any other class, right? Um, I can do this. And so the teacher lines us up, says go, and we start running around that track. And as I come around the last turn, I see the finish line. I think I'm going to make it. And then all of a sudden, I hear the teacher start yelling out numbers. 955, 956, 957, 958, 959, 10 minutes, and I'm still 50 meters back. Cross the line at like 10 minutes and 20 seconds or something. And I'm thinking, oh man, there goes my A. Praise the Lord. Teacher comes to us that didn't make it and said, okay, next week we're going we're gonna to do it again, so be, be prepared. And so that week, instead of training, I was probably playing video games, thinking I'll do it again and I'll hopefully make it, right? So the day of the race comes again, and I'm there on the, fin on the start line, and I'm, I'm kind of like right on the edge. I don't want to cheat, but I, I want to give myself every advantage I can get. And so teacher says, go, and we start running. And there I am. I'm, I'm running as fast as I can. My heart feels like it's going to burst out of my chest. And I come around that last corner again, and I'm expecting to hear the, the teacher start yelling out numbers. I can't hear anything. As people are crossing the line, she's quietly saying the times. So I don't know what's going to happen keep running, I keep running. I cross the finish line. Brad, nine minutes and 54 seconds. Amen? Amen. I did it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I know. I'm a pretty big nil. No, I'm just joking. I, w I was super excited to be able to do that. And I, I tell you that story to tell you this, is that, that running is hard. Think about this. People that do marathons, they're not natural. If you knew anything about where marathons come from, you'd think twice. In 490 BC, the, the Persian Empire, they invade the Greeks in this town called Marathon. And the Greeks, they hold them back for that battle. The generals tell this guy, Phidippidus, hey, run from Maris Marathon to Athens, 26.2 miles away. Tell the Athenians, we won the battle, but the war goes on. So Vidipidus, he runs as fast as he can, 26.2 miles. He tells the Athenians, hey, get ready. There might be another battle coming, but we won the first one. Do you know what happens to that guy right after he tells him? 
he dies. The moral of that story is if you run, you'll, it'll, it'll kill you. That's what I'm just saying. The point is that running is hard no matter what level you're at, no matter how long you've lived for Christ. And make no mistake, this is an analogy for living a life of faith and obedience to Christ. It's not easy. In fact, the, the word run here, let us run with endurance, the word run in the Greek is agon. It is the root from where we get our English word, agony. It's not easy. To live a life of faith in Christ can be demanding, can be grueling. It takes discipline. But the text says we all must run. There's a race laid before us. The Christian life is not one of passive luxury. It's not one of sitting on the sidelines and being like, okay, well, whatever happens, happens, I guess. The author knows the difficulty of living a life of faith in Christ. And so what does he do? He starts with encouragement. Verse 1a states this. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. If you read therefore in the Bible, it means to look back to the previous chapter, the previous chapters, whatever it might be. And if we were to look back at Hebrews chapter 11, what we're going to see is this. It's called the, the Hall of Fame of the Faith. These men and women that have gone before us, that have, that have run this race, they're not running perfectly, they didn't run perfectly, but they've lived this life of faith in Christ, and they're to be an inspiration to us. Now, we're not running for them, but they are there cheering us on. Men like, like Noah and Abraham, women like Sarah and Rahab, and what the author is doing is he's painting this picture of us in the stadium being surrounded by everyone, saying, you can do it. They know what it's like to live a life and the blessing that comes for living a life of faith. And so the question becomes, how do we do it? If we want to run this race, where do we start? Verse 1b, let us also, like they have people before us, let us also lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely, and let us run the race of endurance that is set before us. I want to start with sin. I think most of us get sin. If you've been walking with Jesus for any amount of time at all, you know that sin is not desirable, and sin leads to both physical and spiritual death. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is what? Death. James chapter 1 states this, but each person is tempted... When he is lured and enticed by his own desire, then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth what? Death. So we're to get rid of this sin that clings so closely. But here's the thing, friends. The author here is not talking about lowercase s, lowercase i, lowercase n. He's talking about capital S, capital I, capital N. In your translation of the Bible, you might have the word the before sin, so it would read like this. Let us lay aside, let us also lay aside every sin, or every weight, and the sin that clings so closely. And if that's the case, the author, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is telling his audience, and he's telling us, us there's one specific sin you've got to watch out for. There's one specific sin that's going to that's gonna bring you down like none other. And as we put this into the context of the entire letter to the Hebrews, it becomes clear that the sin is unbelief. Specifically, unbelief that Jesus is enough. We need to remember who this letter is being written to. Converts from Judaism to Christianity. And those, those new converts are coming out of a religion that's all about works. Put yourself in their shoes for a minute. Your entire life you're being brought up. And you're being told, do this, don't do that. Make sure you follow this, don't follow that. 
Make sure you do all these different things, all 600 plus commands you find in the Old Testament. If you do that, you're going to be just fine. And then Jesus comes along and says, hey, the, the, the law isn't bad, but I'm better. I'm gonna, I've accomplished the law. I fulfilled every T, every I. I've done it. Put your faith and trust in me. There's going to be this internal battle going on. Is Jesus really enough? When life gets hard, what are they going to think? Man, Jesus, I love you, but I'm, I'm comfortable with the law. I'm comfortable with the works. When, when persecution comes, and that's what's happening when this letter's being written, what's easy? Going back to the law. I, I know that. And we, friends, we do this all the time in our lives too. Life gets difficult, what do we do? Well, I'll take this up myself, and I'm going to bring it before God. I'm going to make sure I handle it on my own. I know that. That's easy. Having faith in that God will take care of it can be really difficult sometimes. There's this battle going on. And the author's saying, be very careful that you don't let that sin, that doubt, that Jesus is enough, creep in. There's something in the church going on right now that's it's not very new, but it has a name to it now, called deconstruction. And it's men and women who have followed Christ for many years, they are deconstructing their faith. Meaning this is that they start to let unbelief govern their way of thinking. It used to be just younger people. People in college, yo pros, young professionals, and that sort of thing. But right now, it's becoming more and more evident that there are many people deconstructing their faith. So don't think it can't happen to you. The author is addressing each and every one of us, saying, be careful where your thoughts go. Be careful what your thinking is. Because unbelief can bring you down so fast. I think many of us get that. That we forget what comes right before it. And this is where I have a hard time. Let us also lay aside every weight. See, the, the author doesn't start with sin. He starts with weight. And remember, we're talking about running, right? It's an analogy for living a life of Christ. Question for you. When you go for a run or maybe a hike, do you want to put on massive heavy boots? Hmm? No. Do you want to put on a big old ski jacket? No. Do you want to put on like really tight skinny jeans that you can't run, you got to kind of waddle as you're going? No. Do you want a backpack full of stuff that's going to weigh you down as you are trying to run? No, you don't. You want to put on lightweight shoes, some shorts, and a t-shirt. You want to put on the least amount possible and still stay legal out there, okay? You don't want the weight? Running's hard enough. Why would you want to carry around something that's just going to weigh you down? But here's the thing, friends. We all carry weight. All of us. Things that weigh us down could be anything. Things that aren't necessarily bad, but we make them that way. Let me give you an example from my own life. I love my phone. I love watching TV on it, texting, calling. My favorite app, you might not think of it, but it's the calendar app. Meeting with Danny and Haas Thursday at noon. Reminder, one hour before done. Don't got to think about it ever again. this can become weight. I can easily, easily make this weight. Come home and tune out on this instead of tuning in to my family. I can easily watch too many shows on this. And praise God, I have a wonderful wife that reminds me, and I'm not being sarcastic, but she reminds me, Brad, put your phone down. Anything can be weight. Sleep can be weight. Wanting to sleep in. Don't want to get up and do your devotionals. That bed feels really good right now. It can be weight. TV, weight. 
Anything in our lives can be weight. See, the, the author is not saying, hey, just, just look at sin. I think a lot of us get sin. Yeah, sin's black and white. That's easy to see. But is it weight? And so the question is not, is it just sin? The question is this. Is it helping me run or is it weighing me down? Is it weighing me down as I'm trying to be more like Jesus? More kind, more gentle, more loving, more righteous, more holy? As I'm running this race of faith, is it getting in my way? Is it entangling my legs? And if that's the case, friends, we need to get rid of it. Not just, is it weighing me down? Does it help me run? And friends, when you come to this place where you're willing to examine your life and say, God, show me the weight, I can tell you this, there's going to be a voice that, comes, that pops into your head from the great deceiver. And that voice is going to say, is that really worth it? I mean, it's only a phone. It's not that bad, right? It's only a little TV. It's only a little bit more sleep. You don't, you don't got to do your devotionals today. You don't got to get up and pray. It's not, it's not hurting anybody, right? It's only a little white lie. It's a little of this, a little that. And as we look, it's going to seem like a lot of loss and not much gain. And when that happens, friends, I want you to look at verse 2. It says this. As we run this race, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. I want you to imagine for a moment that you are with Jesus during his final hour. It's like you're not, you're not physically there, but you can kind of see what's going on. You see Jesus take his disciples into the upper room. They have the last supper together. They come back down. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus says to the majority of disciples, hey, just stay on the outside. He takes Peter, James, and John and with them a little bit farther and says, hey, pray right here, guys. And then Jesus goes a little bit farther into the garden. He begins to pray. And in his, his prayer, he's thinking, God, tomorrow there's going to be so much loss. Not only is there going to be so much loss, there's, there's going to be mega loss. And it's going to hurt like hell, literally. The weight of sin crushing me. Your wrath coming upon me. How did Jesus do it? How did he see this and yet keep his focus? For the joy that was set before him. For the joy that was set before him. So much loss and yet way more gain. As we run this race, we are to look to Jesus and his example. Friends, I can tell you, the Christian life, there's loss. The Christian life, there's loss. But the gain is so much more worth it. It says, as the, you lose your life, you find it in Christ. And that's what God is calling us to do. And make no mistake, it's not just a one and done thing. You know, like, well, I lost that weight today. I'm good to go. It's a regular thing where we look at our life and say, what's weighing me down as I'm trying to run the race? And as we are looking at ourselves, we don't focus there. We focus on Jesus, looking to Christ. I like how Spurgeon says it. It says that he said this, the Greek word for looking is, much, is a much fuller word than we can find in the English language. It has a preposition in which turns, in which it turns the look away from everything else. You are to look from all beside to Jesus. I think there's another way to help us understand what it looks like to look at Jesus. Jesus says this in John 15, that I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me as I, as I abide in you. When we abide, what we're doing is this. We are saying, Jesus, I'm coming to the end of myself. 
Those things that once brought me temporary joy, I'm getting rid of. And God, my joy is going to be in you and you alone. My foundation is going to be in you. See, here's the thing, friends. I ask you this question at the beginning. Where does your joy come from? If it's anything other than Jesus Christ, you can consider it weight. It's not helping you run. You might have the best family in the entire world, and I hope and pray that you do, but they are not designed to be the foundation of what brings you joy. That weight will crack and crumble. You might have the best job ever. Things are going so good. It won't last. That foundation will crack and crumble. You might have all the wealth, fame, prestige, popularity, whatever it might be, won't last. It's not designed to carry the good times and the bad. Only Jesus can sustain our joy. I want to end with this this morning. I want to connect two dots very quickly for us. Go back to verse 2. It says this, For the joy that was set before him, before Jesus. Question, what, 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 we hit about it, hit on it a little bit. Well, what is that joy? See, Jesus' joy first starts with obedience to the Father. It says that Jesus was obedient even to the point of death, death on a tree or the cross. But we have to ask the question, what, for what purpose? See, Jesus, as he's in the garden, as he's looking out and he sees all the loss, he also sees the gain. He sees the gain, and I want to tell you this, friends, that you and I, we are part of the gain. The joy that's set before him, part of that joy is you and me, because he knew that in his death, he's going to defeat sin, in his resurrection, he's going to destroy death, that we might have life in Jesus. He knows he's going to provide a way that we might have a relationship with God. Friend, if you don't have that relationship this morning, I want you to hear this. Please focus in. Jesus saw you that night too. He saw you right where you're at today. You might be saying, well, Brad, hold on. I, I, I just don't know enough about Jesus. Well, Jesus knows you. You might be saying, Brad, I, I just don't know about that because I've wandered so far and there's no way Jesus could, could possibly forgive me from the things that, that I've done in my life. Jesus is enough. His grace is sufficient. There's no sin that you could possibly have done. There's no place you could possibly run and hide where God's grace cannot find you. You are part of his joy. Jesus knows that we many times try to fill ourselves with other places with joy, but he says, I will be the one to fill that void. I will be the one to sustain you. I will be the one to give you life and give it abundantly, and God does not make it difficult on us. He makes it simple. He doesn't say, well, you know what? You want to have a relationship with me? You better learn this first. He doesn't say, oh, you want to have a relationship with me? You better start figuring your life out and getting that put together before I'll accept you as my child, as a son or a daughter of God. He doesn't say that at all. I love Romans chapter 10, verse 9, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says this, that if we confess with our mouth that Christ is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Period. There's no and do this, confess that Christ is Lord, believe that God rose him, raised him from the dead, and you will be saved. And friend, if that is you this morning and God is tugging on your heart, you can try to run, but you know what? God's bigger. And eventually he's going to get a hold of your heart and he's going to say, I am good and I am great and I want to be your savior because I desire you because you are my creation. Stop running. God wishes that none should perish, but all should reach repentance. And if that's you this morning, come find me afterward. Please, don't let today go. Find Haas or Danny 
or another staff member or an elder board member or the person you've never met next to you and to start talking to them. Say, I want this relationship with Jesus because I, I want to walk with you through these next steps that you might have. Friend, you can look wherever you want to find joy, but it can only come in Christ. Amen? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, God, and just being able to come gather together to get into your word. Father God, I pray for the person out there that might not, might not know you, God, the person that's on the fence. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just continue to speak to their heart. God, we thank you that you are big enough to sustain our joy. That no matter what life throws at us, we will have that, that, that delight knowing that you are taking care of it, knowing that you are big enough to handle anything. And we can walk through the fire, God, knowing you are right there with us. We thank you that you are good and you are great. In Christ's name, amen.